Okay guys, let's get started on and talk about tension pneumothoraxes. First of all, we're going to talk about what is a tension pneumothorax, how it progresses, and what our treatment is, and of course our landmarks. Alright, so first we're going to talk about what causes the tension pneumothorax and what types of tension pneumothoraxes there are. First of all, you have a, uh, the most common cause of a tension pneumo is penetrated trauma to the chest. So you get a gunshot wound, a stab wound to the chest, uh, that is an open pneumothorax. If you have blunt trauma to the chest, uh, you hit a steering wheel or whatever, and you break a rib and you puncture a lung, that is a closed pneumothorax. Okay, now let's talk about an open pneumothorax. This is where you get a gunshot wound or a stab wound to the chest, and you start drawing air into the chest through that wound. Air follows the path of least resistance, and so it's going to go in there. And if it's not able to escape, you're going to increase the pleasure inside your pleural space. And what this does is every inspiration, every ventilation that happens, more air goes in and it doesn't come out. And so it starts pushing that lung, gradually pushing that lung towards the heart, towards the great vessels, and it decreases your cardiac output, decreases the blood coming back to your heart, and eventually you get your signs and symptoms of shock. And that's when you need to decompress the chest. All right, and now we have a tension pneumothorax. And now here are some signs and symptoms you're going to look for. First of all, mechanism of injury. Was he stabbed? Was he shot? Did his chest hit the steering wheel? What is leading you to this, this procedure? Uh, shortness of breath. What's his mental status? Uh, decreased lung sounds on the affected side. Hyperexpansion on the affected side. Because if you've got all that air trapped here, this is going to be expanded out, right? This is going to go up and down. This was going to stay the same. Hyperresonance, I've never heard that. but. If you tap it, it sounds more like a drum. Uh, and of course, you're looking for late sign, tracheal deviation, and JVD. So guys, just a quick word of caution. Make sure you have high index of suspicion that's supported by your signs and symptoms. Okay, because you just don't want to decompress just to decompress because this can cause injury to the lung and the gray vessels. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the equipment choice that you're going to have. Remember when you're doing a needle decompression, you want the catheter to reach into the pleural space. With America becoming so large, we need to pick the largest needle possible. So I have a couple choices here. This is a 3.25 inch uh, 10 gauge needle, which is ideal. This is made specifically for uh, decompression. This is a 14 gauge 2 inch. This would work probably on 50, according to military studies, 50% of the American population on the anterior portion. So, first of all, we'll go over this guy. This comes out, it's 10 gauge, it's a rigid catheter, so it's gonna have difficulty kinking, which is great. There's no flash chamber you have to take out. You can just take this off, decompress the chest. This one, if you're going to use a standard angiocath, you need to bring it out, take off your flash chamber so that you have that that air is able to escape and then put your syringe on. I like to use a syringe because uh, generally if you're in the back of a helicopter or moving the ambulance you, you don't know you can't hear that rush of air and so what this does is it goes on like so you have an extra few inches to hold on to because it's a stressful situation your hand might be shaking you have something extra to go and once you make that penetration you will see the bubbles and you'll know you're in. So if possible, we need to cleanse the site well to, uh, to protect the patient. So uh, use betadine and do a nice circular motion and get it nice and clean. So we, we're gonna go do our, uh, our landmarks. Remember, you're gonna go second intercostal space. First rib is under the clavicle. So you roll down, find your clavicle, you roll down, you find your, the first rib you fill is your second rib. You roll down again, here's your third rib, okay? This is gonna be your second intercostal space, right in here. There'll be times when they'll be so meaty, you'll have to go from this side, where you'll find the angle of Louis, roll down, and that's your second intercostal space, okay? You wanna go midclavicular. So many times we put it on this side, medial of the nipple. We need to make sure it's lateral of the nipple. Think of this quadrant right here. This is where we need to go. So here's your clavicle, goes to here, midclavicular is right here. So now let's review the procedure. I've shown you the landmarks. Now I need to make sure I cleanse my site. I have my equipment. I reconfirm. There's my second rib, my third rib. I know my, my second intercostal space is right here. 
midclavicular. I want to go in perpendicular, 90 degrees. Remember, underneath each rib is the neurovascular bundle that you do not want to hit and cause more injury. So I want to go in, hit the rib, roll over, go all the way down, looking for bubbles. I got bubbles. The catheter goes in. This goes in a sharps container. And there it is. I don't need to tape this down. I just need to monitor that we don't have straps over it, backboard straps, gurney straps. We just keep this open. There's, it's not a big enough hole for any air to get into. It's gonna go through the mouth of the trachea. It's not gonna go through this. So now you've done a very important procedure and now you wanna make sure that you, you watch your patient, uh, make sure the blood pressure comes up, heart rate goes down, mentation increases, oxygenation increases. If for some reason this clogs up, put another one in right next to it. This is not just a one-time thing. You need to monitor this and place another one if needed.